Hi, my name is Jen Karlstrom. I'm a senior scientist project manager for Perkin Elmer, and I will be giving the first part of the, today's talk, Improving Therapeutic Discovery by Leveraging HTSPR to Complement Alpha Liza. And then Noah Ditto, a technical product manager from Cartera, who is there in person, will be giving the second uh, half of the talk. Next slide. FCRN is known as the neonatal FC receptor. It got its name because it was first discovered to be responsible for the transport of IgGs from mother to offspring. FCRN binds to the FC portion of antibodies. Later, it was found that FCRN binds antibodies in acidic endosomes, protecting them from lysosomal degradation. The binding of antibodies to FCRN is highly pH dependent with binding occurring at pHs less than 6.5. The antibodies are then recycled to the cell surface where the increased pH weakens the interaction with FCRN and allows for antibody release. Therefore, how well an antibody binds to FCRN determines the antibody's serum half-life. Next slide. Since the binding to FCRN determines serum half-life, a lot of research has been done to see if modifications to the FC region of therapeutic antibodies can be used to increase or decrease binding to FCRN. In a review by Liu et al., they described the history of FC engineering from mapping the FCRN binding sites in 1999 to rationally designing libraries and screening for modifications that modulate FCRN binding. Listed here are a few examples from the literature of FC modifications within antibodies that can increase the serum half-life of IgGs. Next slide. Techniques that can easily measure binding of an antibody to therapeutic, an antibody therapeutic to FCRN are highly desirable. FCRN binding assays can be used to measure relative FCRN binding after engineering mutations in an antibody. Additionally, FCRN binding is one of the techniques used to show functional similarity between a biosimilar and the original therapeutic. Using more than one technology to determine the relative potencies of antibodies binding to FCRN can build confidence in the data. Here we are presenting two orthogonal FCRN binding techniques that can be used to confirm relative potencies of therapeutic antibodies. Next slide. And so for this first part of the talk, um, I will be focusing on alpha ELISA assays we have developed to detect FCRN binding. Next slide. So what is alpha ELISA? Alpha stands for Amplified Luminescence Proximity Homogeneous Assay. It is a bead-based technology. The alpha beads are hydrogels that minimize nonspecific binding and self-aggregation. They have functional groups that can conjugate different biomolecules. The donor beads have a photosynthesizer produces, that produces singlet oxygen upon illumination at 680 nanometers. The singlet oxygen can diffuse approximately 200 nanometers in solution, making it ideal for looking at large complexes. The acceptor bead is europium based. It's excited by the singlet oxygen. It emits light at 615 nanometers. Some of the benefits of alpha ELISA assays are they are homogeneous technology, mix and read, which means there's no wash steps. They have high sensitivity because of the amplified signal and a very large assay window. There's broad dynamic range. You can measure high and low analyte concentrations. It's highly versatile, compatible with small and large binding partners. It detects a large range of binding affinities from picomolar to millimolar, and it's automatable. Next slide, please. So how did we develop a um, FCRN detect binding assay with alpha ELISA? So we used a biotinylated FCRN that bound to a streptavidin coated donor bead. And we used a human IgG conjugated alpha ELISA acceptor bead. So when we mix the beads and the FCRN together, we get high signal. Then in the presence of your antibody test sample, the antibody, your antibody would bind to the FCRN and compete off the IgG conjugated acceptor bead. 
uh, resulting in a decrease in signal. From this, you can measure IC50 values of your test sample. The protocol is very easy. It's a 40 microliter reaction where you add 10 microliters of your test sample, 10 microliters of biotinylated FCRN, and 20 microliters of a mixture of the donor and acceptor beads. Then the mixture is incubated for 90 minutes at room temperature in the dark because our donor beads are light sensitive. Then the reaction is read on an Envision alpha plate reader. Next slide, please. So here we validated this FCRN binding assay using um, a variety of different uh, human IgG isotypes. We tested both the mixture of IgGs as well as the individual isotypes as shown on the left. We saw nice IC50 curves and the values were all uh, within twofold of each other, which was consistent with literature references. On the right, we also tested uh, four different uh, therapeutic antibodies, adalimumab, etanercept, pembrolizumab, and trastuzumab. And again, all four of these uh, had within twofold differences in potencies. Next slide. So you would say, uh, can the alpha Liza assay actually distinguish between different potencies since we saw all the same potencies? So we uh, validated this by looking at a oxidized therapeutic. So oxidation of methionine 252 and 428 in the FC portion of IgGs has been shown to decrease binding to FCRN. So we incubated adalimumab uh, with 0.3% hydrogen peroxide for one hour, three hours, or overnight. And as you can see, the FCRN binding assay is able to detect a shift in binding potency after oxidation of the FC portion of the antibody. Next slide. So in summary, <coughs> alpha Liza assays are suitable for screening for modifications of the FC portion of a therapeutic antibody for potency shifts in binding FCRN or comparing a biosimilar to a therapeutic drug. The speed and high sensitivity of the alpha Liza FCRN kit and its noteworthy signal to background robustness enables easy assessment of precious IgG samples. Using more than one technology to determine relative potencies of antibodies binding to FCRN can build confidence in the data. So with that, I will hand it over to Noah, who is going to tell you about a second orthogonal technique for measuring binding to FCRN. So my name is Noah Ditto. I'm technical product manager at Cartera. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about assays that we ran on our end to corroborate and, and dig a little deeper into the results found in the Alpha Liza assay. Um, again, with Jen's point she made about being orthogonal in our approaches, um, our technology um, is, is surface plasmon resonance based. So we're measuring real time binding interactions of non labeled partners. Um, and it, so it's a slightly different format than Alpha Liza and a great way to kind of understand results from two different platforms and ensure that we're getting a result that's meaningful and um, can make decisions, drive decisions. So Cartera's technology is the LSA, um, it's a high throughput surface plasmon resonance device. Um, what it effectively does is we array 384 binding species on the, the surface of our sensing chip and we can introduce a binding partner in solution across that array. So what you get out of this is a tremendous throughput gain over um, historical biosensors that are out there. Um, in a typical assay format, in about a day, maybe even a little less, you can screen 1,152 affinities, um, complete affinities with a, a well-defined KA and K, uh, KD. Uh, you can also go ahead and do something like 150,000 competitive interactions in a single experiment to do things like epitope characterization. Uh, so the throughput is massive. Massive. The data coming off the platform is massive, um, and it really enables some types of assays that really just weren't explored on um, these types of systems historically. Uh, kind of shown here in the snapshot is a, a, a very probably difficult to see uh, plot of different sensograms in the upper right hand corner. This is 384 sensograms. This would be just a, a maybe a six hour run, something like that. So huge wealth of data. And then the bottom half is um, one of our publications uh, highlighting a heat map and network plot showing epitope relationships of antibodies. Um, so really, again, just the, the power of the system is in the throughput um, and the ability to drill down and generate lots of data. And I think that was really what drove us to, to 
put this technology uh, kind of um, uh, with the alpha lies in comparing this assay because because while we run the assay and generate data we have the ability to also kind of look at variables in the assay simultaneously given the the, the amount of space or real estate on our biosensing chip um, so we went ahead in the assay uh, doing that and uh, and in the first step here you can kind of see the step number one is we took the antibodies uh, as well as uh, four drugs which Jen just highlighted and I'll show in subsequent slides along with uh, controls, FC fragment, um, fab fragment, and all these done in triplicate and at three different concentrations, translating into three different densities, arrayed that on our sensing chip, chip via mean coupling. Um, so you've got 96 discrete locations on your sensing chip, and this is only a quarter of the capacity of the system, um, but we're getting a huge amount of data again from uh, from one small set of experiments. So first step was arraying that sensor chip with the 96 samples that I just mentioned. Then we moved on to the actual steps of binding. So we went ahead in the first kind of step and did a, a titration of FCRN. So this is um, bound molecules on the surface being probed for binding against um, an unlabeled FCRN molecule. So we're strictly looking at binding as a function of mass at the surface. Um, and that titration uh, was done. And then we moved on to a second experiment where we took the same or the same FCRN at a fixed concentration and then progressively introduced injections with increasing amounts of drug to determine um, potency or IC50s um, uh, from those interactions and develop a, a response curves. Uh, so the outputs really are, are sort of three different things we did with the data. One, we, we did a kinetic fitting of the data to get on and off rates. We also did a steady state fit as well, and that's another way to kind of understand affinity and, and kind of check your work, especially uh, for interactions where there's faster rate constants, sometimes it's good to verify that the, the kinetic fits aren't perturbed by the speed of the interactions. Um, so we did a steady state analysis on the data as well. And then um, for the portion where we we're looking for inhibition, we went ahead and did an IC50 um, inhibition curve plot, and I'll describe that more in the next slide. So FCRN steady state and kinetic affinities, um, one of the first things that jumped out at us was uh, these molecules are very similar, and that's kind of what um, the alpha Liza had just suggested to us, so very similar. Interestingly, in our, our assay that the surface densities didn't have a large impact um, on the reported affinities. Um, in the top half, you have kinetic affinity, so this is a, a measure of affinity determined from the rate constants. The bottom half chart is a steady state affinity, um, dose response, um, fit to a steady state model. And you can see that they're in excellent agreement. We really have um, very similar results from the two models, as we kind of would expect. So we don't see any issues here with, one, the surface densities used. Um, we, can, we can kind of compare a higher density, medium, and a lower density surface. We don't see effects of that. Um, and even within that, um, you can see across the molecules that they were quite similar, um, the exception being a tanner sept, um, which generally had a slightly weaker affinity in this particular format. Um, than the other molecules. Uh, at Tannercept, I actually don't, the lowest concentration, we didn't have sufficient signal really with that molecule to, to show here, so we're only showing the two higher density um, surfaces. But yeah, in the end, um, a huge amount of data, triplicate measures on everything. Um, and in the two different approaches to characterizing affinity, both were in really excellent agreement. We went ahead then also in the other experiment and, and looked at IC50 potencies. So these are plots of those curves. Um, in the assay, we had uh, four different subclasses on the surface, so we could take each drug and, and look at whether or not there was a subclass difference in competition across the molecules. Um, I'm just showing here a subset of the data, which is the five microgram per mil concentration, but we did have those other data sets that didn't show, again, um, an effect of surface density influencing the outcomes of the, the IC50 calculations. Um, yeah, but in a, in a nutshell, the, the Four drugs did show high comparability um, in, in all the conditions tested, consistent again with the alpha Liza. We did notice, interestingly, that a tanner set does appear to be modestly potent. I'll show the values in the next slide for that, um, which was kind of curious because we did see a slightly weaker um, estimated affinity. Um, so that's kind of a curious behavior, but again, it's everything we're looking at here is within twofold. So um, interesting, but not um, probably enough to say that these are markedly different molecules in terms of FCRN potency. 
And then uh, looking at these values, so this is the same data I just showed you, but actually plotting the actual um, IC50 values. So we, I should make a point that the IC50s we report in the LSA are kind of in a different dynamic range because the instrument functions in a different dynamic range than Alpha Liza does. Um, so again, these are relative comparisons and mostly comparisons within themselves of molecules um, across the board. So we can see that, for example, adalimumab, um, very consistent around an 800 nanomolar IC50 in this particular assay format. Um, even across the subclasses, there's only a modest, modest difference among them. Trastuzumab, again, very similar uh, overall. Pembrolizumab was curious um, in that the IG2 actually was slightly uh, less potent. Um, and we kind of saw that in the data, if you happen to catch that, uh, where it was, in fact, um, kind of had a different profile that curved into it. So that was an interesting behavior as well. So there's some subtle differences, but um, again, back to that main point that frankly the data is remaining in twofold. Um, so we have both this, this level of, of assurance that these molecules are similar, but we do see subtle differences here which are interesting, um, suggesting that there's some, some uh, dissimilarities among them, but minor at best. So really, uh, from these assays, the key takeaways were, you know, we went ahead and we want to understand, does Alpha Liza uh, compare with HTSPR in terms of the outcomes? Are we seeing similar results? Uh, the short answer to that is yes, we do see similar outcomes as we would expect, and this is consistent with the literature. Um, but the great part about this is there's really different types of assays that we're exploring here. We're, you know, Alpha Liza with labeled reagents and components versus HTSPR, which is unlabeled, um, and really just your bare binding partners directly interacting. Um, and, and the great part about the, the, LIs, or the, excuse me, the LSA setup was that we had so many variables we could incorporate into the test. So we only used a quarter of, frankly, the capacity of the system to test this, but we were able to test multiple um, surface densities, concentrations, um, IgG subclasses. I didn't even have time here today to really get into the controls listed, but um, lots of other conditions you can build into assays um, to better inform the outcomes. Um, and we'd like to think of this really as, as when you run assays, because we have such um, tremendous uh, real estate on the surface where we can introduce so many species, um, you can both optimize the assay and get your final data in the same go. You really run the assay and find the optimal condition at the end, and that's the data that you progress with. Um, so yeah, the, there was slight differences um, that we detected by SPR um, in this particular format amongst the different drugs tested, but frankly, they didn't, um, they didn't rise to the level of, of suggesting that there were marked differences between these molecules. Um, and, and again, that's consistent with alpha lies in literature. Um, so yeah, we really like to just emphasize that this, this particular set of studies corroborates alpha Liza and importantly highlights that using orthogonal technologies is valuable in order to really understand your biomolecules in this case, FCRN, um, IgG binding, um, because we can run what effectively is one assay and, and take three different measures of the data to understand the interactions there. So uh, with that, I'll wrap things up. And just if there's any questions um, after the talk, feel free to shoot me an email, and we'd love to talk to you. And with that, I'll go ahead and a big thanks to all our Perkin Elmer folks who, who helped support this, both the assays as well as just the execution here. Um, and then Carteris folks as well uh, for, for enabling all this to, to come to fruition. And um, I thank you for your time. <laughs>